I don't know what happened to the millions of dollars Elik allegedly stole from his clients or why he stole the money in the first place. But a team of us at FitzNews.com have uncovered a series of connections tying Alec Murdoch to an alleged drug smuggler. And while we're proceeding down this road with caution, we believe it's very important to this case. My name is Mandy Matney. I've been investigating the Murdoch family for almost three years now. This is the Murdoch Murders Podcast with David Moses and Liz Farrell. Now that Alec is accused of stealing at least $8.4 million from over a dozen clients in a decade, some of the biggest questions in this case are about all of this money. Why was he stealing so much when he was already making plenty as an attorney? Where was all this money really going? Where is it now? What was Alec into all of these years? And just how bad was it? We need to go back in time to start the process of unpacking the answers. To understand Alec Murdoch's ties to drug trafficking, we need to look at a man who was a good friend of the family, a man named Barrett T. Bowler. And just to clear the air, Bowler is spelt like bowl wear, but from what the locals tell me, it is apparently pronounced Bowler, at least with the older generations. Like the Murdoch name and Ellick's name, I don't make these rules up about pronunciation. But when several locals tell me how a name is pronounced, I believe them and I go with it. Now my boss Will and I started looking into the bowlers back in June. We both were getting a slew of tips that told us the same thing. You need to start digging into Barrett Bulware, the dude who Alec bought Moselle from and his connections to drug trafficking. These tipsters would say something like, I don't know how it's connected, but it's definitely a piece of this puzzle. So back in September, things started to really spiral in this case. There was news breaking almost every day about Alec's alleged thievery, the Gloria Satterfield case, and Alec's alleged suicide gone wrong debacle. My boss, Will Folks, and I divvied up these subjects in the best way we could at FitzNews.com, and Will ended up taking the drug angles of this story. And just for background, Will started Fitz News in 2007 as a political blog and was immediately deemed the bad boy of South Carolina journalism for his unflinching takes. Since 2013, his one-man publication has grown steadily in both readership and relevance across the state of South Carolina, earning its place among legacy publications. Will's mission as a publisher and a journalist and our mission at FitzNews.com is to lead an honest, intelligent, and compelling conversation conversation on the individuals, institutions, and ideas we cover, seeking the truth wherever it leads. So I thought it would be best to bring Will on the show to explain his reporting and all that he has uncovered in the Murdoch's connections to the bowlers. Well, they go back a ways. The bowlers, and again, all these Southern names, it's funny trying to get them right. Uh, I always call the Hampton people, say, how do you say this? How do you guys say this down there? And so they, whatever they say back is what I end up calling them. So the bowlers, the bowlers it is, but spelled like bullware. It looks like bullware. I think most people would spell it that way. But um, obviously Barrett T. Bullware, uh, he's a guy who died in September of 2018, a commercial fisherman. He was very close to Alec Murdoch. They were business partners. Uh, they owned properties together. Alec was his lawyer. And uh, in fact, when Bohr was dying uh, in 2018, he signed over his power of attorney to Alec. And it was one of the more exhaustive, expansive, uh, empowering powers of attorney I, I've ever seen. I mean, literally just signed his life over uh, everything he owned um, uh, to Alec right before he died. So, so they go they go way back, but his father, who actually died six years earlier, back in 2012, was tight with Alex Dad, uh, with Randolph Murdoch uh, III. So the families go back. So who are the bowlers? 
There are three things to know about Barrett T. Bowler. Barrett T. Bowler was an alleged drug smuggler charged in Operation Jackpot in the 1980s, which we will explain in this podcast. He was the former owner of the now infamous Moselle property, and he was Alec Murdoch's business partner. Also important to note, he died in 2018 shortly after being diagnosed with cancer. The Murdochs and the Bowlers' connections stretch back to the World War II era when Randolph Murdoch Jr., aka the original Buster Murdoch, tried a few cases with Barrett Bowler's grandfather. I should also say here, Alec Murdoch is definitely not the first Murdoch to be accused of a crime. What I'm about to tell you is a little bit of history taken from news reports at the time. As you'll see, the names are not the only generationally repetitive thing here. So are the shenanigans. After a five-year federal investigation in the 1950s that centered on the Hellhole Swamp area of Berkeley and Colleton counties, which was the location of major illicit liquor activities during Prohibition, Buster Murdoch was one of 30 people, including a couple of magistrates, a sheriff, constables, and at least one sheriff's deputy, who were indicted as being part of a criminal network of moonshiners. Buster, who people here say was mean as a snake, was accused of obstructing a Colleton County grand jury investigation into moonshiners. He was also accused of telling a Hampton County moonshiner to move his distillery to Colleton County to avoid law enforcement. See, in Colleton County, Buster was apparently helping to keep low country moonshiners in business by instructing the sheriff there at the time, who was also indicted, to make quote unquote friendly raids on known violators of internal revenue laws. These moonshiners would get a warning that one of the friendly raids was coming and they would be assured that quote unquote friendly prosecution would follow. The moonshiners said that they paid for this protection. Basically, Buster was accused of creating a scenario in which he and others in law enforcement would look like they were handling the problems with the illegal liquor and the honky tonks while also secretly profiting off of them. It was also around this time that the South Carolina legislature passed a new law that allowed the governor to suspend or remove state and local officials from office if they were indicted. After the indictments, the governor at the time suspended the Colleton County Sheriff, a guy named Haskell Thompson, but Buster was allowed to stay in office. It wasn't until after Haskell's suspension was upheld by the state Supreme Court shortly before the trial was due to start in September 1956 that Buster resigned as solicitor. This wasn't a huge sacrifice for him though, because 1956 was an election year. Buster's name remained on the ballot for November, and no one was running against him, obviously. So all he had to do is somehow survive the trial, and he'd be back in office which is exactly what happened. In August 1956, one month before the trial, Buster had tried to get the charges against him dropped. Ironically, he accused the federal government of promising light sentences to his co-defendants to induce testimony against him. He referred to the charges against him as merely surplusage, which is a word I had to look up. It means excessive or non-essential, and I'm very surprised Dick Harpootlian hasn't found a way to use it yet. So by this time, some of the 30 co-defendants had pleaded guilty, had their charges dismissed or in one instance went missing. So Buster was one of 20 guys who would face trial together. He asked for a separate trial because of what he called the danger of guilt by transference. He didn't want their stink to get on him. The federal judge did not grant him those motions. So Buster went to Charleston and stood trial. The trial took two weeks and two days. They were in session on Saturdays and at night. The trial featured testimony from a witness who said he paid money to be able to carry a constable's badge, which they wanted so they could hijack a distillery for their own use. The jury also heard from witnesses who said that after they'd get busted, they would pay hundreds of dollars to law enforcement officers and to magistrates to avoid jail. One of the witnesses was a defendant in the Colleton County case that Buster was accused of obstructing. He went to prison in 1951 to allegedly, quote unquote, protect Murdoch. Reporters at the time noted the seething sarcasm coming from the defense on cross-examination, and they wrote about how Murdoch's attorneys mocked the witnesses by saying they could have written better indictments against them than the government had written about their client. Somehow, and I'll tell you how in a second, the jury found everyone except Murdoch guilty. His co-defendants were sentenced to a federal prison in Tallahassee, Florida. Former Sheriff Haskell Thompson got the longest sentence of seven years. When the jury acquitted Murdoch, a reporter noted that an unidentified man ran from the courtroom to tell Mrs. Murdoch the news. In response, she wept. After reading the verdicts, the judge, who was from Norfolk, Virginia, decided to offer his opinion that, quote, no solicitor or assistant solicitor or anyone in the solicitor's 
Prosecutor's Office should be allowed to represent any party in any court in a matter arising from a criminal case. The law permitting this should be changed. He also said that, quote, the practice of having special sheriff's deputies without compensation leads to corruption. I should pause to fast forward and remind you that for many years, and until a few months ago, Alec Murdoch was an unpaid, badge-carrying member of 14th Circuit Solicitor Duffy Stone's office. Back to 1956. So about a week after old Gladys Murdoch had her celebratory cry in the federal courthouse, someone got arrested. This someone's name was Alex G. Murdoch of Orangeburg, South Carolina. Alex G. was charged with tampering with the jury that had just acquitted his first cousin, Buster. Shortly before the trial began, a man named Alfred R. Goodwin of Florence, South Carolina, said he had received a call from Alex G., who said he wanted to meet up with him. The two met at a restaurant where Alex G. told Goodwin that Buster was only charged because of political reasons. Turns out Goodwin was about to become the foreman of the jury that acquitted Buster. Alex G. was indicted by a federal grand jury and charged with attempting to influence a juror, and Buster was re-elected for yet another term. And we'll be right back. So at the end of Buster's 48-year reign as solicitor, Barrett T. Bowler had his first of at least three run-ins with law enforcement. In all of the records that Will and our researcher Jen Wood have found while looking at the Bowler family, the first incident showing their alleged involvement with drug trafficking occurred on January 24, 1980, off of the St. Helena Sound. For those of you unfamiliar with the South Carolina Low Country, the St. Helena Sound is north of Hilton Head Island and south of Charleston. It's about an hour and 15 minutes southeast of the Moselle property. It happened on January the 24th, 1980. This was, again, very early in the relationship between these families. A U.S. Coast Guard cutter uh, called Cape Knox was actually patrolling St. Helena Sound off the uh, coast of South Carolina that evening. And again, this is according to reports filed at the time. According to the Associated Press, this Coast Guard cutter spotted a pair of 65-foot fishing boats, uh, one called the Miss Kathy and the other called the Water World. Uh, and this was during what they termed a routine patrol of the sound. Oh, one of the boats was apparently in distress, was um, you know, taking on water, was sinking. And when the, when the Coast Guard boat pulled up, they, they come up to, to Bulwer's boat, uh, or Bulwer's boat, the Water World, uh, and they find 11 undocumented, uh, if you will, m uh, men who were alleged to have been from Miami. Basically, they were on his boat because the, the original boat that they were on allegedly sank. Uh, and that boat was called the Island City. And so at the time, you know, you got this Coast Guard uh, warrant officer who filed a report who said, it was unclear what caused the sinking and that the ownership of the vessel that sank had not been immediately established. But the water world, the boat that these men were discovered on, belonged to Bowler. And so one of the other boats, it's interesting, the Coast Guard had tied to some drug enforcement agency actions. And so, you know, everyone just assumed, OK, well, they came up on these boats, the, the, they saw the Coast Guard coming, and so they put all the product on one boat and sank it. Um, that was generally what, what most people thought happened. And so what was interesting was that none of these 11 men on board the water world, that no one was arrested, nobody was questioned. And as far as we know, these, these guys were just sent back to Miami, <laughs> you know, and everybody just went, went about their business. Um, but, you know, it's kind of odd, you know, you say, OK, so you've got Barrett Bowler's boat out there. You've got two other boats. Uh, one of them has been tied to smuggling in the past. One of them sinks as soon as the Coast Guard boat comes up. It's like, hmm, you know, OK, start putting these things together. It's like, you know, what are they up to out there? I mean, do we really have to speculate too hard about what was going on out there? But um, but again, they questioned all these men, but no one was arrested. And again, as far as I can tell, everybody just got sent back to where they came from. This makes me wonder if there was possibly some interference from someone powerful and influential who could have intervened with the Coast Guard's investigation and allowed Bowler to escape charges. The operator of the other boat, by the way, was caught six years later during a drug bust called Operation Cancer in Florida. I wanted to mention that one of the boats that was involved in that was later implicated in a separate incident. So again, we go back to that 1980 incident. What were they doing out there? Well, I think we all know what they were doing out there. <laughs> 
When you talk about drug smuggling in the 1980s in South Carolina, you will hear the term Operation Jackpot mentioned often. At the beginning of Reagan's war on drugs, a 33-year-old U.S. attorney named Henry McMaster led one of the first federal drug task forces using new federal civil forfeiture laws to combat drug smugglers by seizing assets like homes, cars, money, and boats. In his critically acclaimed nonfiction deep dive into the gentleman smugglers of the 1970s and 80s, Jason Ryan describes, quote, a cadre of freewheeling Southern pot smugglers who lived at the crossroads of Miami Vice and a Jimmy Buffett song. The interagency operation included agents from the Internal Revenue Service, U.S. Customs, FBI, and the DEA. While smugglers and kingpins evaded arrest for years, the subsequent manhunts across the world concluded with captures in Antigua, Australia, Miami, New York, and San Diego. The surviving gentlemen smugglers still gather occasionally at an event they call the Felon's Ball. Operation Jackpot really cranked up in the, you know, after Ronald Reagan uh, was elected and took office in January of 1981. That's when these seizure operations really started ramping up. And again, it was more than just seizure operations during jackpot, because one of the things about jackpot that was interesting is that it gave the federal law enforcement uh, agencies and their partners expanded access to go after the property and holdings of anyone that, that they connected to these uh, various operations. And so what you had was all of a sudden, instead of just uh, stopping at the specific uh, drug conspiracy or alleged conspiracy, what they could do was go into other properties owned by the people that were involved in these operations and start investigating them and seeing what turned up there. And so it represented a major expansion in the war on drugs. And at the very tip of that spear in South Carolina was uh, current governor at the time, he was the U.S. attorney, Henry McMaster. And so he played a starring role in this uh, new operation, which again was focused on a lot of the offshore, uh, alleged offshore drug uh, traffic off the coast of South Carolina. So why was South Carolina the perfect place for smuggling drugs? One of the most attractive things about South Carolina at the time was the coast was largely undeveloped, unlike Florida, and it features hundreds of tiny barrier islands that are perfect hiding spots to hang out until the coast is clear, and there's also a lot of places to stash illicit goods. South Carolina law enforcement was not only ill-equipped to handle any extensive patrol of the coast, some, as you learned earlier, were easily paid to look the other way. It's a part of the coast that there's not a lot of development. It's a part of the coast there's not a lot of light. Uh, it's a part of the coast where there's a lot of easy access from the water to roads. And I think that's one of the things that, as this conversation continues, we'll probably get into that when we start looking at some of these properties that Alec Murdoch and, and Barrett Bowler are connected to. But yeah, it's just the perfect place to move product, to get it quickly off boats, onto vehicles, and then up the interstate and to your distribution networks. So that brings us to February of 1983, when Barrett T. Bulware and his father were first hit with federal charges related to drug smuggling. According to an article in the Tallahassee Democrat, U.S. Customs seized 17 tons of weed and $33,000 from Bowler's shrimping boat. Yeah, this incident in February of 1983, we start to see, okay, this isn't just speculation. You know, after the 1980 incident, you could obviously make a case, oh, well, maybe they were really fishing. Maybe they were doing this. But mm, we get to 1983, and in this incident, you've got another uh, U.S. Coast Guard cutter called the Ute encounters a boat called the Janine Ann, which is another shrimping boat that was owned by Bowler. And they found on that boat a total of 854 bales of marijuana. Now, authorities let this, uh, this boat, the Janine Ann, they allowed it to proceed to its destination, which was Beaufort, South Carolina, again, right near the St. Helena Sound. Once the boat gets there, obviously, numerous arrests are made. And Bowler was arrested, his father was arrested, and both of them were facing charges in connection with that incident in February of 1983. So again, we're not speculating anymore. There were warrants actually issued for their arrest based on probable cause, based on alleged smuggling activity at this point. But something extremely suspicious happened to the captain of Bowler's boat, who was a star witness in the case against the Bowlers. The case against the Bowlers is proceeding, and there's a star witness. His name is Franklin C. Branch. And again, those of us who follow the, the Murdoch lore, who have been working 
you know, at exposing this family and its, uh, its connections. Um, you know, this guy's name has become sort of iconic. You know, we all talk about, you know, getting branched, you know, if we expose too much or uh, find out too much. You know, this is a guy who was scheduled to testify against both the Bowlers, father and son. But in April of 1983, uh, according to the Tallahassee Democrat, this guy's on his way to a bar in St. Joe Beach and he, quote, walked into the path of an oncoming vehicle. And to the credit of the local paper down there in Florida, they did say, hey, this wasn't, you know, this didn't happen in a vacuum. This guy was one of nine people who was arrested back in February uh, in a marijuana seizure and that he was scheduled to testify in a drug trial. So again, to its credit, the Tallahassee Democrat did provide some of that context that's so often missing in mainstream media coverage today. But they did talk about it and they did reference that. But, you know, bottom line, with Branch dead uh, and without his testimony, the feds had to abandon the case that they were pursuing against the Bowers. Um, And in fact, in June of 1983, the federal government dropped all charges against both bowlers. These were all federal charges. This is one of those stories that's really jaw-dropping when you think about it. And it's amazing that the Tallahassee Democrat picked up on this at a time when you couldn't just Google a name. It makes me think that the reporter was given a tip that something more was going on here. What a coincidence that the guy who was apparently essential to the case against the bowlers was killed in what seems like a strange incident as he's about to testify in a major drug smuggling case hit by an oncoming vehicle. The initial reports don't lead to any questions about whether or not that was suspicious. Again, this is 1983. It's an era where you could kind of run people over and disappear without there being a lot of, you know, quite the same level of digital surveillance. And, you know, we didn't have cameras on every street corner then. We didn't have GPS in cars back then. We didn't have cell phones tracking people from this tower to that tower. Uh, We didn't have all the same information about who people were when you actually had someone either in custody or being questioned. So again, it was just a different era. And again, I'm not necessarily saying that this was foul play or that Branch was murdered. But again, a month or two before he's supposed to testify in court on some major charges to people who are part of a significant smuggling operation, yeah, it's a bit suspicious. So... It's also odd that the loss of one witness would apparently submarine the entire case against the bowlers. This, again, makes us question if there was some sort of powerful intervention happening that saved the bowlers from facing prison time. And while we have no proof that Henry McMaster had anything to do with the charges getting dropped, it's not lost on us that he was a U.S. attorney in South Carolina at the time and was the leader of this massive investigation. And Henry McMaster, the current governor of South Carolina, still, to this day, has a lot of connections to the Murdoch family. McMaster, along with the majority of politicians in South Carolina, has stayed mostly quiet in regards to the Murdoch murders and the other crimes attached to it. He hasn't once done anything to publicly call out the corruption that has been uncovered, nor has he done anything to put pressure on authorities to solve these crimes. In one interview with the state newspaper in September, McMaster called the Murdoch murders one of the saddest stories he's ever heard. And that's all he said. Well, I mean, there's a lot of connections as far as that they supported him politically. They've supported him financially. Obviously, he honored Randolph with the Order of the Palmetto uh, not long ago. As a matter of fact, that was right before the boat crash, I believe. There's some definite connections there. And again, the Murdochs also very closely intertwined with that trial lawyer community. Obviously, Henry McMaster spent eight years as Attorney General of South Carolina, so he's very close with those folks as well. It's part of that South Carolina judicial community that they watch out for each other, you know, they they try to protect each other. And I think the question that we're having to grapple with as we look into the Operation Jackpot connections to the Murdochs, you know, the question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, were they watching out for each other in a way that potentially could have gone much deeper than we know? There's been a lot of speculation in recent weeks. Well, was uh, U.S. Attorney McMaster targeting certain rivals to the Murdochs uh, or, or business associates of the Murdochs? And again, haven't seen anything that would would support that. To some degree, I think you have to look at the 1983 case involving the bowlers, and you want to hope 
that McMaster and the feds were really pursuing them and were genuinely trying to get justice in that case and that they just caught a bad break when Franklin Branch died. But again, I think one thing that all of us covering this family have learned <laughs> over the last couple years and certainly the last few months is there aren't a lot of coincidences when it comes to these people. If you're looking for uh, an innocent explanation, you know, you're going to be looking a long time because there's just not a lot of innocence related to anything that these guys have been involved in. And we'll be right back. So after all of this, after drug trafficking charges against both bowlers were dropped, the younger of the two was charged again just a few years later, this time in Georgia. In the late 1980s, sometime before November 1988, Barrett and his wife were sitting in the back seat of a car she had rented for a trip from North Carolina to Miami and back. They were stopped for speeding right near the Georgia and South Carolina line in Chatham County, which is where Savannah is. This is not too far from where we live in Beaufort County, and not too far from Hampton County and Allendale County, where the bowlers lived at the time. The trooper grew suspicious and asked for permission to search the car. The driver said he had no objection to a search, and the front seat passenger opened the glove compartment and pressed the button to pop the trunk, where there was seven pounds of marijuana and 28 grams of cocaine. The bowlers were convicted. He was convicted of trafficking cocaine and possession of marijuana, and she was convicted of possession of marijuana. They tried to appeal the decision on the grounds that only Mrs. Bowler could have granted permission for the search, since she was the one who had rented the car. Their appeal was denied. We're not sure what happened next, though. We don't know whether the bowlers served any time for their crimes, or whether they were given one of those, quote, friendly sentences we talked about earlier. So Barrett Bulwer and Alec Murnock became business partners in the late 1990s. The first record our researcher Jen uncovered is from 1998. It shows that a company called Murdoch Holdings and Barrett Bulwer purchased a stretch of remote waterfront property on the St. Helena Sound for $115,000. Ellick and Barrett again purchased several more remote waterfront properties around St. Helena Island in 2003 and 2004, and we will get into those properties in a minute. But Ellick also represented Barrett Bowler in a civil case in 2006 against Salkahatchee Closings. But the Bowlers in the Murdochs weren't just business partners. And the other thing that's interesting, you know, we were talking just a moment ago about their business connections, their property connections, uh, their connection as, you know, Alec acting as Barrett Bowler's attorney, but they were also very friendly socially. Um, they would go to basketball games together, parties together. You know, the couples uh, were often seen together out on the town. So it wasn't just a, a work relationship, they were friends. And in fact, a lot of the, the old money in Hampton would always look at the Murdochs and the Bowlers together and would wonder, okay, what, you know, what's going on there? Because pretty much everyone knew what, what Bowler did for a living. You know, everybody knew what, what his line of work was down in Hampton. So they were kind of surprised to see Alec publicly associated with him. According to sources close to these families, in private, the Murdochs and the Bowlers were very casual about the family's history with smuggling drugs. These sources say that on the wall of Bowler's living room, right above their fish tank, was a photo showing Cuban men on a shrimping boat holding up bags of cocaine. Quote, They talk about drug smuggling like it was a casual conversation, one source close to the family told me. They were proud of it. The Murdochs were around for these conversations, according to my sources, and would laugh along with the bowlers as they chat about their drug smuggling days. Keep in mind, this is when Alec Murdoch was carrying a badge for the 14th Circuit Solicitor Duffy Stone's office, and ostensibly had been sworn to uphold the law. The Murdochs and the bowlers were close like family. They spent holidays together. In 2013, the Murdochs purchased Moselle from the bowlers. We have heard that Alex helped get the bowlers out of legal trouble and the Murdochs were given Moselle as a thank you gift, but we haven't found any legal records to support those rumors. Either way, the Moselle property exchange was interesting. It was purchased by, uh, I think Alec Murdoch paid Bulwar's wife, or Bulwar's wife, $5 for the property. And again, that was an interesting transaction because everyone's kind of like, well, wait a minute, $5? What, what's the deal with that? But if you look at the actual deed, it talks about the $5, but also the exchange of like-kind replacement property. 
and the total value of that uh, replacement property was $730,000. These sorts of exchanges, are, they're actually very common and they're entered into by people who want to avoid uh, paying capital gains taxes. And they can do that if they sell a property and then take the proceeds and then buy other properties with it. So basically what you do is if you want to sell your property and you don't want to pay taxes on it, you just take the proceeds and buy more property with it. And a lot of property investors do that. So there, there is a le legitimate use for it. But again, as we've seen with the Murdochs, you know, legitimate processes can be turned to illegitimate <laughs> means, you know. I mean, these folks are, are experts at gaming the system and, and trying to find holes in the system that they can exploit. And there's something else about Moselle that we should talk about. The property had a landing strip. I have seen video of a small plane landing at Moselle in 2018. According to my sources, the Murdochs would casually talk about how the landing strip used to be used for smuggling drugs. Very close to where Paul and Maggie Murdoch's bodies were found last June, there's a large shed next to the dog cages. The shed has monstrous doors that were big enough to fit a plane in. Our researcher at Fitz News found that Barry T. Bulware obtained his pilot's license in 1997. He purchased Moselle in 2000 and apparently owned a plane up until he sold Moselle to the Murdochs in 2013. As we're finding out more about these criminal ties to the Murdoch family, and as we're looking into one of the biggest questions in this case, which is not only where the money went, but why Alec Murdoch allegedly stole it, we're reminded of these passages in Jason Ryan's book, Jackpot. People heavily involved in the drug trade, particularly on the importation side, have a lot of overhead expenses. Purchase of boats, airplanes, paying vessel captains and offloaders, purchase and rental of stash houses, attorney's fees, etc. Even so, if they are even mildly successful smugglers, they stand to make a lot of money. Critical to every operation was finding an isolated spot to unload the drugs. The best sites featured a dock close to the ocean, the absence of neighbors, and proximity to major highways. And I think the big question of all this, of all these stories that we're covering is, to what end? We talk about that with regard to the money, where's the money going? Uh, we talk about that with the motivations for these crimes, like why were uh, Maggie and Paul killed? Um, we talk about it with the death of, of Randolph Murdoch the timing there right after the Mazelle homicides, I mean, it all just, nothing adds up. Nothing adds up. And another thing that just doesn't add up, like we said, Alec and Barrett were business partners, but usually businesses try to make money. Businesses that invest in property usually try to sell them at a profit. Barrett and Alec bought a lot of properties together, but they sat on them, even through major real estate booms in Beaufort County. In an upcoming episode, we'll take you through the land that they purchased together and why each one raises even more questions about what Alec Murdoch was up to before his wife and son were murdered. We will also talk about something that even shocked me, and I rarely get shocked anymore, the jellyfish gambit. But when you start looking at how close these two families were, again, it's just hard to avoid the connection there. And once you start looking into Bowler's past and his family's past, and you start looking at the sort of operations that they were clearly uh, mixed up in, you know, it just raises so many more questions about what were the Murdochs up to? Did those other activities, again, whatever they were, I don't know, were they running drugs? Were they laundering money? Again, we don't know at this point, but they were clearly into something. And the question is, was that something they were into? Did it play a part in some of these, these crimes that we're all covering right now? Visit FitzNews.com and check out an amazing video by my colleague Dylan Nolan that shows these questionable properties purchased by the Murdochs, Bullwares, and their associates. Be sure to follow Fitz News on YouTube to check out our latest videos on the Murdoch murder saga and I will post those links in the description. 
Before we go, I want to take a moment and thank all of you who completed our recent survey. There is still time to go to MurdochMurdersPodcast.com slash survey for a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card. We want to learn more about you and what matters to you, and we want to improve this podcast every week. Be sure to like the Murdoch Murders Podcast on Facebook and Instagram so you won't miss any future giveaways and the latest updates in this case. We want to thank everyone who was able to support Hopeful Horizons in our January Merch with a Mission campaign. Because of your sales, we are sending a big check to Hopeful Horizons, and that is a big deal. We also decided to partner with Hopeful Horizons for our merch sales throughout March. So be sure to visit Murdoch Murders Podcast dot com slash merch to check out our awesome that is a big deal t-shirts our cup of justice mugs and other really fun items 100 percent of the proceeds will go to hopeful horizons hopeful horizons is a children's advocacy domestic violence and rape crisis center together we can create safer communities by changing the culture of violence and offering a path to healing learn more at HopefulHorizons.com. The Murdoch Murders Podcast is created by me, Mandy Matney, and my fiancé, David Moses. Our executive editor is Liz Farrell. Produced by Luna Shark Productions.